Hi, my name is Guy Wallace, and in this pack video short, we're going to discuss EPI and PACT. PACT is an acronym. It stands for Performance-Based, Accelerated, Customer and Stakeholder-Driven Training and Development. EPI is also an acronym. It stands for Enterprise Process Performance Improvement. Whereas PACT is an ISD methodology set, EPI is a human performance or performance improvement methodology set. When I created the PACT processes, I was cognizant of the fact that oftentimes performance problems are not due to humans and their knowledge and skill deficits. There's other reasons. There's other issues with humans and there's other non-human issues that often are at the root of a performance problem and or opportunity. The PAC processes are a subset of the EPI methodology. EPI Stage 1 is for targeting enterprise process performance improvement opportunities, addressing problems. The first phase, similar to CAD, is project planning and kickoff. Then there's an analysis of the current state in Phase 2. In Phase 3, you design the future state and understand the gaps between the current and the future. And then in Phase 4, you do implementation planning. You consider the Pareto Principle, where you might get 80% improvement from 20% of the interventions. Unless you're striving for 100% perfection because it's necessary to the situation, you're probably going for the biggest bang for the buck and you don't want to go those last miles because the return on investment for those add-on, those final interventions, may not be worth it. In EPI Stage 2, you start off with project planning and kickoff, then you conduct analysis and design, develop an acquisition of the interventions necessary, and then you pilot test them to make sure that they're going to work before you do a general release. Post-pilot, you revise your interventions and then release them. Stage 1 leads to Stage 2, just as in the PAC processes where a curriculum architecture leads to multiple types of MCD and IED efforts. We're using the same kind of a pattern here. The concept rests on this Enterprise Process Performance Improvement Graphic, the big picture of EPI as I like to call it. On the top hand left you can see that the enterprise could be broken down into functions and departments. And yes, an enterprise might have business units or divisions and then lead to functions such as human resources or sales or engineering, etc. And getting down to the department level. We look at processes within the department's viewpoint. We can look at the leadership processes, the core processes that makes that department different from all others, and the support processes. When we look at processes, we can use Gary Rumler's swim lane process maps and understand the flow of tasks and outputs and where they're produced. Or we can use the PAC processes performance model as a way to capture the outputs and their metrics, the tasks, the various roles and responsibilities, which are kind of the swim lane turned sideways, and then the gap analysis. So the format for a performance model captures a greater amount of detail than a typical swim lane process map. But you need to use whatever your organization is accustomed to using. From there we can do an Ishikawa diagram kind of cause and effect fishbone diagram and we can break that down into human assets that are required and the environmental assets that are required. At the bottom of the chart, in no particular order, on the left are the human asset enablers. Humans bring awareness, knowledge, and skills to the process. They also bring their physical attributes, or lack thereof. They also bring their psychological attributes, or lack thereof. They also bring their intellectual attributes, or lack thereof. And they bring their personal values to the process. What's required of the human assets depends on what's the process and what are the env environmental enablers available? Do I need the physical strength or do I get to use a forklift truck? The environmental asset enablers 
enable the humans and the humans facilitate and use the environmental assets within the process. Those environmental assets include data and information, materials and supplies, tools and equipment, the facilities themselves and the grounds, budget and headcount, and the culture and consequences. Humans exist within facilities, they exist within cultures, and there are consequence systems that govern the positives and negative consequences, short term and long term, that affect human behavior. But it really all starts with the process. In the first place, the process must be designed to meet all of the stakeholder requirements. Well, who are those stakeholders in your situation? And what are their requirements for the product and or the processes, the tasks? Sometimes stakeholders care about both. Sometimes they're focused singularly on the outputs and they don't care how you produce them. Or they don't care about the outputs. They care about how you produce them. For every individual process or groupings of process, we can accumulate what those human asset requirements are and what those environmental assets are. When we find a deficiency in the human assets or in the environmental assets, we can begin to look at those human asset management systems that provide and assist the development of the humans to make them capable, capable enough to meet the needs of the process. We can look at the environmental asset management systems to determine if there are deficiencies in the environment. Upstream, these systems supply the assets required of the process. If they're deficient, we need to go upstream and look at those. So on the human asset management systems, we can be looking at the organizations or the people responsible for doing organization and job design and redesign to see if we've got the jobs designed adequately. Or the staffing and succession planning systems. Or the recruiting and selection systems. Or the training and development systems. Or the performance appraisal and the performance management systems. The compensation and benefit systems. The reward and recognition systems. These are the systems that bring in and do the care and feeding of the human assets that are either adequate to the needs of the process or they are not. Likewise, we can look at those systems that provide the information and data, the materials and supplies, the tools and equipment, the financial requirements, the facilities and grounds, and the culture and consequence to assess whether or not they're adequate or not. And if they're not adequate, we can go work on those systems to make sure that they are provisioning to the processes what the process requires. When we look at department, we can look at the management areas of performance or major duties or key results areas, same language, areas of performance. And we can look and see, well, what are the leaders doing and the managers doing that's core to their work? They're either planning work, and assigning work, and then monitoring work, and then troubleshooting any issues that they find when they're monitoring the work. What they're planning, and assigning, and monitoring, and troubleshooting are the individual processes of their department. These are the things that make one department unique to the next. Sales is doing sales kinds of processes. Human resources is doing human resource kinds of processes. The compensation department is cutting paychecks or doing electronic data transfer and deposits. These are what make the organizations at the department level or team level or function level, depending on how you have organized your people and processes and assets. But this was what makes one department different from the next. What's common across many departments are the leadership kinds of processes. The processes for doing stakeholder relationship management and then system governance. This is checking in with all of your stakeholders, understanding what it is that they want from you, how well you're doing at meeting their needs currently, what their issues and worries are about you meeting their needs in the near term and the long term, and then governing the rest of your system, your organization, to make sure that you're going to be at the ready. You're going to be capable of meeting your stakeholders' needs. Your stakeholders include the customers as well as others, the owners, the employees, suppliers, your customer's customer, and that customer's customer. 
Next is strategic planning and management. All organizations do this and theoretically they should all tie together, much like the financial systems. Budgets roll up, budgets roll down. Strategic plans and planning should do the same. Operational planning and management is where those budgets are put together. Results measurement, planning and management is the same thing. Here's where goals cascade up and down. Process improvement planning and management is a leadership responsibility. Communications planning and management and making sure that the communication channels are in place and working adequately to the needs is a leadership responsibility in this model. At the support level, these are also shared areas of performance or processes. Process design and redesign can be shared and done in a similar manner. Human asset management, the hiring, the appraisal, the compensation are typically controlled and are shared across all departments. Environmental assets management, requesting capital budgets, doing preventive maintenance, etc. That can all be controlled and shared across all the various organizations. And then there's the catch-all special assignments. When we look at the human asset management systems that are responsible for the care and feeding and provisioning of the humans with the right stuff, the right assets to the process, we can use this diagram as a diagnostic tool. We won't find our organization with departments or sub-organizational entities named thusly, but we need to find out where is this functionality happening? Who is responsible for organization and job design and the systems that control that, that govern that? Where is staffing and succession planning systems happening? Is this every department doing this on their own? Or is there some HR type group that's doing that on behalf of the entire enterprise? Who's doing the recruiting and selecting? Is that just the recruiting and selection department or is that a shared responsibility between that department and the individual managers that are looking to be the hiring managers? Training and development. Is there a central training group? Are there divisional training groups? Is there local training? Are we managing that? Performance appraisal and the management systems. Performance appraisal and performance management systems. Where is that happening? Who's responsible for that? Compensation and benefit systems. Who's responsible for that? Are we having turnover in our human assets because we're not paying adequately compared to the people down the street in our geography? What about rewards and recognition? Are we adequately providing rewards and recognition for good work? Are we rewarding individuals or are we rewarding teams? Likewise, in the environmental asset management systems, we can use a diagram like this to use as a diagnostic tool. We will not find organizations organized thusly. There may be an IT system, but there's more data and information that, provide, that are provided to the processes that come singularly from an IT organization. Materials and supplies is more than the materials organization. The tools and equipment systems are more than the tool locker. Facilities and grounds are more than the maintenance crews. Headcount and budget systems are more than the financial organizations, although they're overseeing all of that most likely. The culture and consequences. Who's in charge of making sure that we have the right culture, that we have the right consequence systems in place, that we, re that we are rewarding what we want and discouraging what we don't want? There are many ways to organize this view, but all of these systems here provide humans and non-human assets that are either adequate to the needs of the process or they are not. I've been practicing, publishing, and presenting on these methods since 1982. My recent book, Six Pack, covers all of this in great detail.